Hello everyone. Uh, we are now talking about hypothesis testing. So statistics is more than just parameter estimation. Uh, it's but it's possible that we don't actually care about the actual value of a parameter, but rather whether the parameter falls into some range of interest. And in such a case, we may prefer uh, a hypothesis test rather than a confidence interval. So um, in this chapter, we're going to see for the first time statistical hypothesis testing involving only a single sample. These are hypothesis tests involving the values of parameters and uh, hypothesis testing can make statements uh, in, in general. Like for now, we're talking about whether the parameter of interest, maybe it's the mean, maybe it's the median, maybe it's uh, the variance or something. We're asking whether a parameter falls into some range of interest like for example uh is the param is um like some groups mean iq greater than 100 or something uh so we have a question like that that we're trying to answer using a data set um and uh here we're talking about a parameter but in general you could ask general questions like does the data come from a particular distribution are these two variables independent of each other and so on and so forth uh, so more general hypothesis tests i would say are going to show up in later classes uh, i'm thinking that this will be the last chapter of math 3070 it's possible that in the future um, i may rejigger the course and cover things from chapter 9 uh, which would talk more about hypothesis testing but for two samples but I think this is going to be the last chapter covered in Math 3070, but certainly Math 3080 would be talking about other hypothesis testing situations, uh, including like the chi-square test, where you're asking questions like, are two variables independent or not? Or does this variable come from this distribution or not? Uh, stuff like that. Hypothesis testing is an extremely popular procedure, and that means that it's very much abused. Um, there is a sense in which uh, the hypothesis testing being done by uh, practitioners, admittedly, uh, non-statisticians out in the field, uh, is um, kind of suspect and uh, in a, not really in accordance with what statisticians think people should be doing. So I should mention that while hypothesis testing is a popular tool for data analysis, it is certainly not the only tool for data analysis. It, sh it is not appropriate in many situations. Um, although there are situations that do, in fact, call for hypothesis testing. So um, we should uh, we should um, we should be aware of that. There was actually an ASA statement uh, put out uh, a few years ago. Um, actually, it was uh, 2016 where they really just kind of tore into how p-values were being interpreted and used uh, in uh, in science and say and saying we're pretty sick of this. There's a particular way to do it. Ultim I have my own opinions on why hypothesis testing is being uh, is a uh, it why why there are issues involving hypothesis testing. Uh, but uh, I don't think I'm going to discuss them in this video or uh, any of these videos. I may discuss them in like an aside video on uh, the issues surrounding hypothesis testing. Uh, but anyway, we're going to start out by describing the hypothesis testing procedure. So a statistical hypothesis is a statement about the probabilistic properties of a data generating process, a test of hypotheses, is a procedure where uh, sample data is used to decide which of two competing hypotheses better describes the process that generated the data. I should probably just mention right now, as you're starting to watch this video, there's a lot of vocabulary. And one of, one of the things that you need to learn from this video is the hypothesis testing framework. And that's a lot of vocabulary. It's a lot of concepts all at once. And you just kind of have to learn them all at once. So uh, be aware of that. There's there's just there's going to be a lot of vocabulary and a lot of 
concepts coming up. So pay attention to those. So we have two competing statements about uh, a population or a data generating process uh, that we're going to decide between using a test of hypotheses. We have a null hypothesis, usually denoted H0. This can be thought of as the current assumption about the data, while the alternative hypothesis, usually denoted HA, is the assumption that will replace the null hypothesis if we reject the null hypothesis. If we don't reject the null hypothesis, we do not say that we accept H0, but rather that we fail to reject H0. Actually, I would say that hypothesis testing is... Uh, a proof by contradiction or an argument to absurdity. Um, uh, reductio ad absurdum. Uh, this is basically what we're... The null hypothesis is not necessarily something that we actually think is true. It's a statement that we want to disprove. Um, so what we... And how we disprove the null hypothesis is we assume that the null hypothesis is true. We assume it is true, then we collect data. After we collect data, we decide, does this data seem reasonable if the null hypothesis were actually true? Or is instead the data absurd in a sense? And if the data is absurd, if the null hypothesis is true, then we should reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. In other words, we observed an outcome that, under the null hypothesis, is completely unreasonable. Well, not completely unreasonable, but highly unlikely. And because of how unlikely it is, we should no longer believe in the null hypothesis and instead believe in the alternative hypothesis. This doesn't necessarily mean that the null hypothesis is true if we fail to reject it. It just means that we couldn't actually make that art, that appeal to absurdity. Right? We basically observed an outcome that, under the null hypothesis, isn't unlikely enough. It seems somewhat plausible that we could see that if the null hypothesis were actually true. Which doesn't mean that the null hypothesis is true. It just means that we can't disprove it. And the, and, uh, the implications of this is... Um, is important. I like to think of hypothesis testing as um, uh, being essentially the same as um, uh, 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 this uh, Roman principle that is used in uh, the American legal system and uh, pretty much, I would say, uh, any legal system that's based off of the English legal system where you're having... Um, uh, uh, trial by jury, uh, trial uh, you know trial by your pre by your peers and um, where the no and where you have precedents basically those basically English common law uh, you have this you have this notion of uh, innocent until proven proven guilty which was originally a Roman idea and the idea is the person on trial is innocent unless the prosecution is able to uh, bring evidence that would lead us to, assume, to to believe that the assumption of innocence is ridiculous. So you have this uh, uh, so uh, we so the, the jury is essentially required to believe that the person on trial is innocent and we're going to assume that they're innocent. And the prosecution is going to bring evidence to try to render that belief in innocence absurd. Where it would take great leaps of faith in order to actually continue to hold our belief that the person on trial is innocent. Um, uh, you can think of it as... Um, uh, like, it's possible that the, that the prosecution can bring evidence that is... Uh, that, that, that seems a little odd. That might not uh, be completely uh, in alignment with uh, the presumption of innocence. But it takes a great deal. But, but it's not enough to just show that the... Um, it's, it's not enough to just show that something isn't quite right about the person on trial. 
what it takes is to um it is to um uh prove beyond reasonable doubt uh that a person is innocent so there's some criteria by which it would it would take almost a miracle for this person to not be innocent anymore uh, to be to to remain innocent so yeah that's oh, that's a way that i like to think of it the null hypothesis is on trial you are looking for evidence that the null hypothesis is on uh, that the null hypothesis is guilty of being false um and uh in favor of the alternative that is and um you're just and uh you're going to look at your data evidence and um and decide whether that evidence is enough to reject your initial belief in the innocence of the null hypothesis where innocence of the null hypothesis is that the null hypothesis is not false and that it's true um all right uh so in this chapter, we're, we're considering tests that make statements about a population parameter theta. These tests always take the following form where the null hypothesis, which we denote by H naught, um, says that the true parameter value theta is equal to theta naught. Okay, let's uh, be clear about what it is we're talking about here. We have a null hypothesis, H naught. This phrase right here should be understood as a sentence, like an English sentence. Under the null hypothesis, theta equals theta naught. So the null hypothesis says theta equals theta naught. And theta naught is going to be a number. So you will, you're going to replace theta naught with a number. Uh, like, I don't know, uh, like a zero. Like zero is a number. So the null hypothesis will say something like theta equals zero. Theta is the population parameter that you're actually interested in. Under the null hypothesis, you say the population parameter is zero or something. The, popula the population parameter theta is 10. The mean IQ under the null hypothesis is 100. You're going to say something like that. The alternative hypothesis is a competing statement for what the parameter value of theta could be. And again, this is a statement. You should understand this as being a sentence. So the alternative hypothesis says one of the following three things. It says either theta is less than theta naught, theta is greater than theta naught, and theta or theta is not equal to theta naught. And here I wrote it, like I wrote three statements, but just to actually you know what i don't like writing this anymore i'm going to change how i've been teaching this class and similar classes um um I, i'm going to change how, how i'm going to present this right now one of three it, the alternative is going to say one of three things uh theta is less than theta naught theta is greater than theta naught Theta is not equal to theta naught. Pick one of these three things to be your alternative. And the theta naught that uh, you pick uh, for the null hypothesis is the same uh, theta naught that's showing up uh, in the alternative. So if your null hypothesis is that the mean IQ is 100, the alternative will say the mean IQ is not 100. Or the alternative might say the mean IQ is greater than 100. Or the alternative will say the mean IQ, the mean IQ is less than 100. Something like that. Uh, the two hypotheses, the, the two alternative hypotheses on the uh, left and right hand, stop that, uh, on the left and right hand side, these are one-sided. And the reason why they're called one-sided is because under these alternative hypotheses, theta is either larger or smaller than what you believe under the null hypothesis. The middle case, where theta is not equal to theta naught, this is a two-sided case. So this is a two-sided alternative since you're saying 
theta is either less than theta naught or greater than theta naught. And in either case, the alternative hypothesis will be true. In the one-sided case, let's say we're talking about theta greater than theta naught, this, this alternative right here. If, we're, if that is our alternative, then if we are actually seeing evidence that theta is less than theta naught, we are not going to reject the null hypothesis because while we have some evidence that theta is not equal to theta naught, we don't have evidence that the alternative is a better descriptor of what theta is. So you're not going to reject the null hypothesis. And, that, and that's one reason why um, you almost want to say with hypothesis testing that your uh, null hypothesis is going to be theta is less than or equal to theta naught or theta is greater than theta naught. This, or, and so something like that, you want to use an inequality in the null hypothesis. Why is it that we're using equality? Well, you're, you never actually see that because the moment you set the alternative hypothesis to be one-sided, uh, that's implicitly what the null hypothesis will be. The, so if you say that your so if you say that your alternative hypothesis is that theta is greater than theta naught, then implicitly the null hypothesis is that theta is less than or equal to theta naught. So you get it automatically. The reason why we don't use the inequalities in the null hypothesis is mostly because when we're going to test um, and try to decide between the null and alternative hypothesis, we're going to use uh, we're going to assume that the true parameter value is theta naught since um, that's the, that is the value of theta on the boundary of the region dividing the null and alternative hypotheses. That is the value that is essentially the most, uh, the, 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 the value that would be the most difficult to distinguish between the null and alternative hypothesis. So since it is on the boundary of the region between the two uh, between the two hypotheses being true, it is essentially the most difficult case to disprove. So it is the best case scenario. It is the um, um, it's kind of the worst case scenario, I guess, would be the term for the null hypothesis. Or so the best, yeah. Yeah, it's like the worst case scenario for the null, hy null hypothesis, the one that's the most difficult to distinguish uh, between the two. So you're just going to assume that it's true. So you're going to set it equal to a parameter value. But yeah, we actually can decide. We actually can have null hypotheses of this form. But when we do, we always say equals rather than less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. Because the, because the uh, case where theta equals theta naught is like the most difficult to disprove. So we call theta naught the null value for theta, and it is and it is the assumed value of theta under the null hypothesis. Uh, maybe read about this. Uh, maybe read these notes some more. Like there's a lot of, I've written a lot of notes here, and if and if some of this is and you have some questions, I do hope that you read them, because yeah, there's a lot of concepts going on right here, and I will, and and I and I do and I can see why students find them confusing. Uh, so a statistical test of any form, uh, follow the follow the procedure described below. There's basically one recipe for performing a hypothesis test. And all that changes is the details, right? So what changes is what exactly you put into the recipe. But there's essentially a hypothesis testing algorithm. And here is the algorithm. First, identify the null alternative hypothesis. Second, specify a number alpha in 0, 1, which is usually small, uh, which uh, that alpha are typically 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, or 0 0.001. And there is an interpretation for what alpha is. I'm going to explain that later. But you have to pick an alpha, and this will be your significance level for the test. All right. Uh, collect data and compute your test statistic. Call the random version of the test statistic t for now, and let the computed, uh, the observed or computed value be t hat. If the null hypothesis is true, then we know what the distribution of t will be. Step four: compute a quantity known as the p-value. Denote here p-val. The definition of the p-value in general is that the p-value is the probability that the observed, that you observe a test statistic more contradictory to the null hypothesis than t hat. So you have some test statistic. You have a test statistic that you computed from your data, 
And as I described before, you want to decide whether this test statistic seems ridiculous under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. What does it mean for the test statistic to be ridiculous? It means that, uh, well, the way we would think about it is, what is the probability that we would get a test statistic even more ridiculous than what we actually saw? If that number is small, then we're going to say that the test statistic we saw is actually fairly ridiculous. So if we saw, so if this probability is going to be 0 0.0001, then that means that the probability of observing a test statistic, at least as contradictory to our null hypothesis, at least as ridiculous um, under the null hypothesis, is 0.1%, which means that what we saw in our sample is actually quite unlikely if the null hypothesis is actually true. And if that's the case, we're, we should probably reject the null hypothesis. On the other hand, if we compute our test statistic and we get a p-value of, um, uh, let's say, 0.5, then that means that half the time we're going to see a test, a, a test statistic at least. A, half the time we're going to see a test statistic at least as contradictory to the null hypothesis as what we actually saw. In which case, our test statistic isn't all that ridiculous. It's quite plausible if the null hypothesis were actually true. So if that's the case, we should not reject the null hypothesis since we don't actually have good evidence that the null hypothesis is false. We have something that could in fact happen if the null hypothesis were true. Um, all right, so what does it mean then? Uh, what is our threshold then for ridiculousness? Well, it's our, 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 our number alpha. If our p-value is less than our number alpha, we've basically said, okay, the test statistic we saw is too ridiculous to keep the null hypothesis. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis. If this is not the case, then you don't reject the null hypothesis. So there, and because of this rule, we sometimes call the p-value the observed significance level of the test as, it's, as it is the smallest alpha at which you would reject the null hypothesis. Or, or similarly, the largest alpha for which you would not reject the null hypothesis. After that, you're going to conclude the test and interpret the results. So in other words, what does this mean if we're going to reject the null hypothesis or not? Because there is always a meaning. There's always a meaning to your hypothesis tests, and there's always consequences for your hypothesis tests. You should be thinking about the consequences of the test. What is the consequence of rejecting the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative? Does this mean that we're going to change our beliefs about something? What are the consequences of changing those beliefs? How are we going to act? Keeping in mind the greater context in which a hypothesis test is being performed is essential to doing hypothesis testing correctly. And also in deciding what to, like what your significance level should be and what your sample size should be for your hypothesis test. You should always have that greater context in mind. So uh, to be clear, because statisticians will get really angry if you, if you say this wrong. I've even read books myself where they're doing some hypothesis testing in the books and I see them cite a p-value, and they say, well, the p-value is this, and it's like, oh, please, please don't say that. I really liked your book, and then you and then you misinterpreted the p-value. <laughs> um, all right, here is what a p-value is. The p-value is the probability of observing a test statistic at least as contradictory to the null hypothesis as the observed test statistic. The ASA put out a statement saying, this is what a p-value is, Anything else you say is wrong and you should not say it and it's misleading. So for example, here are some incorrect interpretations of what p-values are. The, these, by the way, are incorrect statements. The p-value is the probability that h naught is true or false. That is not true because whether the null hypothesis is true or not, uh, true or false, is not a random state. It is a state of nature in this framework. So... Um, it is not random. It exists. So the either the null or the alternative are true or false. It's just that you don't know which one is which. You're collecting data to try to decide which one is which, but you don't know which one is which. 
nature is not randomly deciding between the null and alternative hypothesis being true. Right? So it, th since that's the case, it does not make sense to talk about the probability the null hypothesis is true or false since the, since whether it's true or false is not a random thing. So that's the first incorrect interpretation of a p-value. The second one, and by the way, these are two, but there are many. Uh, the second one is the probability of the conclusion of the test is due to random chance alone. That is also seen as just as 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 wrong. So um, let's see what I need to think about for a second. Why exactly that's a uh, uh, incorrect. Um, hmm. Why is this an incorrect interpretation? Um, yeah, I, I think it's just not sufficiently accounting for the poor type two errors. That's, that's the best guess I have. Um, I gotta have to, I should, I should probably go look that up. Um, why exactly this is incorrect. Um, I, th I guess it would be like, it's always like, you're always random sampling. So you're always randomly deciding between the null alternative hypothesis. So there's always some random chance, I guess, I guess like random chance alone is an ill-defined term. So that might be one reason why this is incorrect, but it's certainly not, uh, what we would say. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the thing about a p-value is while a p-value is written in terms of a probability, it itself is not um, describing the probability of anything that's currently taking place. Oh, that's probably what... Okay, I think that's the reason why this is wrong. Um, this again, It's basically for the same reason that the first statement was wrong. Um, after we compute a p-value, it's not a random number anymore. It's a statistic. So it doesn't really make any sense to talk about the probability um, that uh, that something is due to random chance or that the null hypothesis is true. Any such statements are going to be incorrect because we're not dealing with random things anymore after we conduct a test. So, yeah, that, so it just ends up being a nonsense statement in this framework since the null hypothesis is either true or not. And we're measuring the the uh, and we are using the p value as a measure of how contradictory our test statistic was to the null hypothesis. So it can be viewed as a measure, but not as a probability. I think that's the way you should probably think about it. Um, okay, so um, all right. So additionally, practitioners should not fret exactly what the threshold of a p value passes. Here's the thing. Oh my gosh, there's there's just so much to be said uh, about this. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, so journals really, they really like, for some reason, like p-value is less than 0 0.05. I think, now the thing is, I, I can't really say for certain because I have not tried myself to publish in like a biomedical journal or... Uh, an economics journal that's about economics and not a, about econometrics, right? That's not publishing just econometric work, but it's about economics and trying to make statements about economics. So I cannot really say from experience what current journal publishing practices are in fields outside of mathematical statistics or more theoretical econometrics, where certainly everyone in theoretical econometrics know uh, what... Uh, know about the issues surrounding hypothesis testing. So I've heard news that there might be some improvement uh, in in publishing practices, but at least it's historically. There is this issue about journals basically not publishing papers where the p-value is less than 0.05 because it's a very simple cutoff. Too simple. It's deceptively simple, and statisticians didn't want hypothesis testing to be used this way ever. Hypothes statisticians have been railing against uh, um, uh, hypothesis testing practices for a very long time. Um, in fact, it's just it's almost like the, a favorite whipping boy. Um, the, the thing about uh, journals is that uh, that are being uh, done by uh, run by non-statisticians but are using statistics in their work. Uh, 
you have this publisher pairs phenomenon and you have uh journals deciding whether they should publish a paper or not and um yeah i was hoping i was thinking i was going to do an aside video but i can't i cannot separate the discussion <laughs> so um uh and and they started saying okay if your p value is less than 0.05 then we'll basically publish your results then you have significant results so for starters there's nothing special about the 0.05 threshold. There never was. I think there was a joke that uh, in statistics classes, you're taught to check for p-values less than 0.05 because that's what's done in the real world. And in the real world, people uh, check p-values less than 0.05 because that's what they learned in their stats classes. So when did it start? Well, I think the way it started is um, it was either Fisher or Naaman and Pearson uh, to... Or who are um, his, uh, very important, uh, uh, who are very important individuals in the history of statistics, who were coming up with the theory of hypothesis testing, and they needed to have a significance value. So this, by the way, this by the way um, is uh, this 0.05 is corresponding to alpha. So they're like, what is a good value for alpha? Because you can't for what for starters, there's never going to be an alpha. I mean, there's there's there there's no such thing as the correct alpha without further parameters. Um, so you have to have an alpha, and it's always going to be a number that you pick. It's basically a parameter of your of your of your experiment. Um, so it's like, so how should we pick alpha? What 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 can we do? And I think they were like, well, we could try 0 0.05 because it's it's pretty small. All right, so they just threw it out there as a possibility. Although at the same time suggesting that there's more you could do to actually uh, to actually pick alpha in a more intelligent way by again thinking of the consequences of rejecting the null hypothesis or not and they just threw it out there and people just have been using it ever since even though there was nothing all that special about alpha equals 0.05 the same thing goes for confidence intervals by the way why do we compute 95 percent confidence intervals because someone well the reason why is because someone said well 95 percent is a big number so, I mean, that's close to 100%. It can't be 100, but we want it to be big. So 95% seems reasonable. It was totally a rule of thumb from the beginning, right? It, it was just a suggestion. Uh, there are more precise ways to think about how to choose confidence levels, how to choose significance levels, and so on. Um, and, uh, but... The thing is, there's nothing particularly special about any chosen specified significance level. So while I did say in my algorithm um, that you're going to choose your significance level, and then if your p-value is less than that significance level, you're going to reject the null hypothesis. Uh, if you get a p value of 0.051 in your alpha that you chose with 0.05, you should you should still reject the null hypothesis or not, um, because 0.0. I mean, if you're right at the threshold, you're kind of on the border anyway. It's kind of a suspicious test, but um, but but basically, you should not think there's anything all that special about being slightly about being slightly above or slightly below 0.05 or any significance level for that matter, all right? Um, we need to have that rule in there. We need to have that step five because that's the only way to really make any sense of what it is we're doing. But there was, but you, you had to pick a number. It's a parameter of the problem. If you, and if you're just slightly off, then don't just reach a, then don't just do what the algorithm says and reach a conclusion. Maybe investigate your data more. Um, maybe just, just, make a judgment call on whether you should re reject a null hypothesis or not. Like if you're saying your p-value should be less than 0 0.05, but um, you were trying, but you're hoping that your p-value is actually much less than 0 0.05 and then you get 0 0.049. Maybe you should not, maybe you should say we're not super confident in the, in this hypothesis test. Yeah. I, I personally think, that a lot of the abuses that come from from hypothesis testing are just based off of publishing practices. <laughs> like it's it's like this is essentially because of pu publishing practices. That's my opinion. Um, because there's this publisher par parish culture. 
people need to publish results, and journals want their results to be significant. And by the way, the word significant. Oh man, this is not going to be an aside video. The word significant has a very English meaning. And by English, I mean English UK. Because significant there just means it signifies something. So it's kind of an older notion of the term. It signifies something that doesn't mean that it's groundbreaking results. Right? It just means that there's something there. Right? It means... I, I mean, I view hypothesis testing as uh, an attempt to distinguish signal from noise. You are trying to decide when you're doing hypothesis testing whether there is whether you are able to differentiate an effect from noise. That's what I would say hypothesis testing is. Like, for example, you observe a sample mean, and um, that sample mean may or may not, like, suppose that your your null hypothesis is that the true mean IQ is 100, and you get a sample mean of, of 101. The question then is, is 101 different from 100? And it may or may not be depending on how much noise there is in your data, how random your data is, how spread out it is. And hypothesis testing is a tool that we use to uh, potentially decide whether um, there is enough, uh, whether whether the noise is too loud for us to uh, distinguish, um, to, to distinguish an effect or not. Right? So you might look at 101 and say, well, 101 is essentially 100. So I don't really care one way or the other. So um, that's, 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 that's what I think. Um, and, and a lot of these publishing practices are about journals saying uh, we want significant results. So there's also this phenomenon known as um, null hypo no alternative hypothesis bias or, bi or bias against the null hypothesis where journals want to see the null hypothesis rejected in their papers. And there is this, um, uh, just this inclination amongst journals to, um, to publish paper, like even some papers that don't reject the null hypothesis, um, they'll, they'll publish some of those, but they have a tendency to be uh, drowned out by the papers where the null hypothesis is rejected. And this can cause problems. For many reasons. One of the reasons being that the null hypothesis not being rejected is an interesting could be an interesting fact in and of itself. Um, uh, it could signify effectively that, well, if for, for starters, it can prevent other researchers from uh, from repeating other people's work where the null hypothesis was not rejected, right? So if you like, papers are supposed to be a means by which. Uh, scientific information is communicated and by not publishing uh, cases where the null hypothesis was not rejected, you're actively inhibiting the ability of science to communicate with itself by letting people know what are dead ends. Or even if it is a dead end, like is it? it's a little unreasonable to call it a dead end to say the null hypothesis was rejected. It just means that this belief about, like there isn't evidence against this belief. Basically. Ugh. I'm just I'm just getting really worked up about this, um, <laughs> um, so that's a uh, that's 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 one thing, and uh, another thing about uh, a, a, another consequence of this bias against the null hypothesis uh, is that when statisticians when researchers start doing their experiments, they really want to see the alternative hypothesis get rejected because they invest a lot of money and time in their experiments and they need to publish a paper or else they won't get tenure. And as, and as a result, they're given strong incentives to cheat, which ultimately to me, if you're, if you're incentivizing cheating by uh, making the results of hypothesis test, the criterion by which you will decide whether something will be published or not, um, it doesn't matter what criterion you use it will always fail. Like the, the null hypothesis testing procedure was devised as a way for people to, uh, it was never intended to be a criterion by which papers would get published. 
It was never intended to be that. Um, it was always intended to be a tool by which people could decide whether there was evidence against uh, whether there was evidence in favor of theory of a theory or not. So it was just meant to be an additional tool in people's toolbox to decide what is and isn't scientific truth. Um, but instead, it's turned into a criterion for publication. And which is ter- which is which is infuriating to statisticians. And the fact is, if you replay, if you decide that you're going to publish a paper based off of any magic number, like p is less than 0.05, then it, then you are giving people a strong incentive to cheat. And any measure will, um, and any measure will fail under such conditions. And we will be ranting and railing about the abuses of that measure and how that is a bad measure when it's not even the measure's fault. It's not the, the procedure's fault, per se. It's just people are abusing it because they're given an incentive to cheat. Like, it, like the Bayesians would like to think that, uh, or, or Bayesian statisticians would like to say that null hy- they don't use null hypothesis testing like this. They have a completely different idea. And in their framework, uh, statement, and, and in their framework, statements like those that I said were incorrect interpretations of p-values, you can actually say that in a Bayesian world. You can actually say stuff like this if you're using Bayesian statistics. You can talk about the probability that H0 is true or false, right? So you can do stuff like that in Bayesian statistics, and they would like to say, well, then that makes our methods better because they don't have all these issues with p-values. No, no, you can cheat with Bayesianism too. There are ways to cheat with Bayesianism too, right? There's going to be a way to cheat with any statistical method if you're giving people an incentive to cheat. I would say that the, that ultimately all of these issues surrounding null hypothesis testing, in my opinion in my humble opinion, because I don't know very much. I'm only 28, right? So um, I don't know very much, but I think that the problem is, is that uh, journals are deciding whether, like when you're conduct all of this stuff, all of this hypothesis testing stuff was supposed to be done a priori. You're supposed to make your decisions about your significance level, about your sample size, about what your known alternative hypothesis are, what it is that you're studying, all those decisions need to be made a priori before you see any data. And um, um, journals deciding whether after they see the data to decide to publish a paper or not is basically violating that principle of, um, of uh, making your decisions after data has been seen. So... What I would say is, is that in actual scientific practice, of like the only way to fix these problems, because this is actually a, a highly controversial and a, like there's a reason why I'm getting worked up about this. Uh, the 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 results of this type of analysis um, are 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 papers that are largely wrong, <laughs> and to the to the extent that I I heard a rumor that. Uh, some editors of biology journals say we think forty percent of the pu- stuff we publish is wrong. That's 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 a huge failure. That is a failure <laughs> because think about it. the The null hypothesis was probably being rejected in thirty percent of those papers, or or fifty percent of those papers that that are wrong. Um, and this is it's it's produced what's known as a reproducibility crisis, um, where supposedly in science you should be able to reproduce other people's work and uh, it can't happen. Like, uh, well, basically people try to reproduce other people's work and they don't reject the null hypothesis in the, in the other study due to sample size issues, due to possibly P hacking, all this other stuff. There's, there's all sorts of ways you could uh, do a bad statistical analysis. Um, and uh, at some point, I'll return to the lecture. <laughs> um, and uh, you and uh, there's all sorts of ways to do it badly, and the result and and the result of that is that you try to re- uh, reproduce the study, and then in the re- reproducing study, it it just doesn't work out. And there's this idea in science and how science should be done that any study that gets published should be reproducible someone else should be able to read how the study was done um and then redo the same thing but with different data and hopefully they'll get the same results but they don't and often the null hypothesis is not being rejected 
and that's and and uh, that's because basically people were cheating. And, and it may not be literally cheating. It may not be going against the literal ethical codes that would cause papers to get retracted or stuff like that. It may not be almost you. You might say uh, de jure cheating, but it is de facto cheating um, in the sense that there's 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 some some dishonest motive um uh you know they you know they act within the within the rules but uh their motive is to get a a a rejected null hypothesis and um at the end of the day uh the reason why this this happens in my opinion is because what the journal should be doing is they should be accepting papers based off of the merits of the study itself rather than the study's results, right? So it would even be better if um, a paper author were to submit everything except the conclusion of a paper, submit that to the journal, and then the journal decides based off of the procedures listed and the statistical procedures suggested, but no actual data, um, and also just based off of the plausibility of... Um, um, uh, off of the uh, off the result, uh, 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 the plausibility of the of the suggested design, whether they can actually do it or not, they might give them, they might pre-approve the paper, or they might pre-accept it, and um, at, after that, they're not going to change their mind based off, the, off of the null hypothesis being rejected or not. <sighs> okay. I'm sorry. I I just had to ramble on about that. Like this is something that makes statisticians really mad. So <laughs> this is something that will get that will cause heated debates <laughs> and, and discussions among statisticians. And I do feel like people must hear it. Right? People must hear about um, how to do hypothesis testing correctly because it's not even just about hypothesis testing. And the issue goes beyond hypothesis testing. You can cheat with confidence intervals. If you're you if you're adopting any sort of simple metric to decide whether something should be published or not, if you're adopting any central me- simple metric to decide whether any practice will be rewarded in any way, then statistics is just going to fail as a subject. Um, all right. Okay, back to the lecture. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but I just had to say that I had to get it off of my chest. So there will no not be a stats aside issue <laughs> episode, or maybe there will be because I could say even more. Um, in hypothesis testing, this, by the way, is also how you can decide what I'm about to say is a way for you to decide what alpha should be. Um, because as I said, there are consequences to hypothesis tests. And here we start thinking about those consequences in hypothesis testing. There are two types of errors. There are type 1 errors and type 2 errors. A type 1 error, which, okay, I'm I'm just going to say it. That's not super great vocabulary, type 1 and type 2. You just kind of, this is like the one area where you actually just have to memorize which is which. (laughs) Sorry. It's the the natural language. It's it's a little unfortunate. So a type 1 error is rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. So... Um, let's go to a simple example where we're trying to decide whether a coin is fair or not. A type one error would be when you say a coin isn't fair when it actually is. A type two error is failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. So a type two error would be saying that the coin is a fair coin when the coin is actually not a fair coin. Uh, I actually like to construct a table when trying to visualize the relationship amongst, uh, these amongst these types of errors. So we have uh, a couple dip- different options. Uh, we can reject a null hypothesis or not reject. Uh, so uh, you can either reject or not reject. Um, and the null hypothesis is either true or false. So the rows correspond to a state of nature. In nature, the null hypothesis is either true or false. 
and the columns correspond to a decision on your part as the uh, study practitioner, uh, as the person initiating the study, where you're either rejecting or not rejecting the null hypothesis. If the null hypothesis is in fact true, and you reject the null hypothesis, then you have made a type 1 error. If the null hypothesis is true, and then you don't reject it, you haven't made an error at all. There is no error. If the null hypothesis is false, and then you reject it, then you haven't made an error. And by the way, um, regarding like uh, uh, some of that stuff that I was talking about before, like it's possible that theta equals theta naught, and the alternative says that theta is greater than theta naught, and you don't reject the null hypothesis even though you got an estimate for theta that's much less than theta naught. So that would be like um, you say under the null hypothesis, the, the probability of the coin comes heads up is 0.5. Um, the alternative hypothesis says the probability of coming heads is greater than 0.5. And you compute a sample proportion and you decide that you're not going to reject the null hypothesis, but your sample proportion was 0.1, right? This is, you would think, is didn't we just decide the null hypothesis is true, but it clearly isn't because 0.1 is very far away from 0.5. Let's say your sample size is like a thousand. So, uh, so um, it's probably <laughs> the case that uh, the null hypothesis is false um, as written down. Well, actually, the null hypothesis as written down isn't actually what you're considering. Like, you're always deciding on whether the alternative is a better descriptor, and the alternative is not. So we would not say that we have made an error. So, uh, finally, the last quadrant, the null hypothesis is false and you don't reject it. That is a type 2 error. So, uh, immediately after a test, you don't know whether you committed an error or not because the purpose of the test was to decide whether the null hypothesis was true or false. So you're not going to actually know whether you made an error. So error analysis is something that you're going to do as a part of the study design, and it's going to be how you choose certain parameters that are honestly unspecified. Um, for example, um, the the, this uh, significance rate, alpha, you would decide your alpha based off of this uh, type of analysis because alpha is the type 1 error rate. Actually, uh, there are situations where alpha is not exactly the type 1 error rate because the stuff that we're doing is highly discrete. We're going to see examples of that. But for the most part, it's a desired type 1 error rate, right? So alpha should be understood as a at least a desired type 1 error rate, if not the, the type 1 error rate. So alpha is, in fact, uh, the probability of a type 1 error. So um, because if your p-value is less than alpha, you're going to reject the null hypothesis. Right? So... Um, and that's why it's, that's essentially why it's the type one error rate. Um, uh, okay. So, um, uh, all right. What was I going to, where was I going next? Okay. It's very important to think of what type one and type two errors mean in terms of the context of the experiment. For example, let's say that we're trying to decide whether a person has cancer. The type 1 error means that... Um, uh, so, usually, the null hypothesis would probably be something that says, like, this person doesn't have cancer. And the alternative hypothesis says they do. So, one problem with talking about cancer is that the stakes are extremely high. So, any sort of uh, error is very bad. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll use both, um, let's talk about both about cancer and also about appendicitis. Appendicitis is when your appendix goes bad. Uh, it is not fun. I have had appendicitis. I have had my appendix removed. It was a funny story and I will not share it here. Um, so let's, let's say, uh, um, let's, let's start out with appendicitis. If 
the null hypothesis says that a person doesn't have appendicitis and you reject the null hypothesis and say they do, you're going to subject them to a surgery that they don't need um, to re remove an organ that they don't need, right? Because the appendix is, is a superfluous organ. So, um, so in that case, there almost might be a bias to saying that you might be willing to uh, tolerate a higher type one error rate at, because the type because a type two error is saying this person doesn't have appendicitis, which is what the null hypothesis says, when in fact they do. And if a person has appendicitis and it's not and, and the appendix is not removed, it's not treated, then the appendix will burst and they may die. That's bad. So uh, you may decide um, that a type 2 error is very bad and you want to make the probability of a type 2 error very small. Um, can, where, and a type 1 error is not so bad because they don't need their appendix anyway. It might eventually go bad. So let's just take it out. Um, that's So you might accept a higher type 1 error rate. Now... Take cancer. Um, a type 1 error is saying a person has cancer when they don't. Uh, and a type 2 error is saying they don't have cancer when they do. Okay. Both of those things are really bad. <laughs> uh, saying someone who doesn't have cancer when they actually do have cancer is really bad. It kind of probably it probably depends on the cat on the cancer. If it's a fast acting cancer, then you've probably just killed them. Uh, if it's a slow-acting cancer, then it's possible that if you've made a type 2 error, then things are going to um, stay bad, and hopefully you'll get a second shot at checking whether they have cancer again. So that so if it's a slow-acting cancer, it might not be so bad to make a type 2 error. Because a type 1 error means you're going to subject, subject this person to chemotherapy and radiation therapy and all of these therapies that on their own are extremely damaging to a person's body. So a type 1 error in that situation would actually be very bad. So it almost would give a doctor reason to say, the evidence is not too... Con there's some evidence in favor of cancer, but it's not super convincing, and we're not checking for a fast-acting cancer. So let's wait on... Let's sit on this for a little bit, come back in a month... And we'll check it again. Right. So that might be what happens. Or they might say there's zero evidence at all. <laughs> but all right. That's why I think it's partly. This is how you can try to remove some of the ambiguity from the hypothesis testing framework by thinking very hard in terms of the consequences of the proceed of the of the null alternative hypothesis. There are always consequences all the time. Right. Even in a scientific study, if you reject the null hypothesis, you're going to change what people think about the underlying phenomena. That has consequences. All right? So, these always have consequences. All right. Um, another way to think about alpha, I wrote down the probability of a type 2 error, but there's another way you should probably write it too. This is the probability of rejecting the, the null hypothesis given that uh, the null hypothesis is true. This is slightly abusive in notation unless you're a Bayesian. Um, because the event that the null hypothesis is true is not a random event. But it's still pretty useful to think about it this way. All right. And also, you, you can then very quickly become a Bayesian if you want. Um, uh, so in this context, the type 2 error rate depends on what the true value of theta is. So uh, I said the null hypothesis before is that a person doesn't have cancer, and the alternative is that the person does have cancer. Um, but actually, um, it's not as simple as saying a person has cancer. Um, it's You can say it's an either-or thing, but also there's like uh, a rate at which the cancer is growing. Something like that. Uh, so... There it, so 
If the null hypothesis is false, and we're talking about what the value of a parameter is, theta a, then whether we make a type 2 error depends on that true parameter value. Let's go back example to, uh, to the example of a coin. Uh, a type 2 error, so your null hypothesis says that the coin is fair, and the alternative says the coin is not fair. A type 2 error is saying the coin is fair when it actually isn't. Well, then the question is, what actually is the, the, the probably the coin comes heads up? If the probably the coin comes heads up is 0.51 and you're only, you only have a, like 10 flips in your sample, then actually it's going to be really hard to distinguish between um, the coin being fair and the coin not being fair. It might be almost impossible. So the probability of a type 2 error rate of a type 2 error in that context would actually be quite high because uh, the null and alternative hypotheses are almost exactly the same. Or, or the null hypothesis and the truth are almost the same. Um, uh, and it's hard to distinguish a coin where the number of flips is 0.5, uh, where the probability of getting heads is 0.5, from one where the probability of getting heads is 0.51. Now compare that instead to a coin where the probability of getting heads is point, uh, where under the null hypothesis, the probability of getting heads is 0.5, when in truth, the probability of getting heads is 0.9. It should be really easy to distinguish, uh, to actually reject that null hypothesis in that scenario. Because you're going to get like 9 heads out of 10, which is pretty far away from what you would otherwise normally see if the, if the coin was a fair coin. So, um, uh, so that would be a situation where the probability of a type 2 error is quite low. So, uh, type 2 errors always depend on the on the truth essentially um so we might have so we'll say that beta of theta a that is the probability of making a type 2 error when uh, uh theta is equal to theta a uh so there's actually a concept that relates type two errors to type one errors, and it's the power of a test. So there's so the power of a test is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when theta equals theta a. So um, so pi um, so pi of theta a is uh, equal to the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis um, given that theta is equal to uh, theta a. Or you should think of theta a as being the truth, right? The true value of theta a, uh, uh, of theta, sorry. Um, <sighs> Oh, and my rant about p values, I didn't even talk about stars. <laughs> stars. <laughs> stars are kind of ridiculous. Um, all right, anyway. Um, I, I was just looking through my notes. Um, anyway, uh, power actually nicely relates both uh, type 1 and type 2 errors because uh, pi of theta a in general, that's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when theta equals theta a, which is the opposite. And that event is the opposite of not rejecting the null hypothesis when theta equals theta a, so that should tell you that those are complementary events. And thus, you get that the power at theta a is 1 minus the type 2 error probability at theta a. So you have that relationship between uh, power and type 2 error rates, and additionally, the power at theta naught, the power at theta naught, that's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when theta equals theta naught, or in other words, when the null hypothesis is true, and that is going to be alpha, as described er earlier. Based off of this, we actually have the following relationship between alpha and beta. You can increase your type one error rate um, um, to decrease your type 2 error rate.
for theta a in general. So that means that type 1 and type 2 errors are almost, well, you can tell from how they were described that they're kind of these mutually exclusive things. Um, and to increase the likelihood of doing one is to decrease the likelihood of doing the other and vice versa. So it may be tempting to say that alpha should always be 0.00000001 and we will never make a type 1 error. Okay? Well, then we're going to make type 2 errors all the time. We don't want that. <laughs> like, there's an easy way to never, ever, ever make a type 1 error. Never reject the null hypothesis. Say the null hypothesis and then immediately say it's true. <laughs> so that's a way to never make a type 1 error. Which means that you will only ever make type 2 errors and you'll probably make a lot of them. I think a lot of people in politics like to do this. So um, they're very prone to it. Uh, as opposed to, say, um, you make a null hypothesis and then you say it's false. You are a contrarian, right? You're, the null hypothesis is always false. In, th in that situation, you will never make a type 2 error, but you will always make a type 1 error. Well, I mean, you're yeah, if you make an error, it's always a type 1 error. So, in fact, your type 1 error rate will probably be quite high. So, uh, these, these, you actually have to balance your type one and type two errors. And this is a part of study design, essentially. Um, this is why you have to think about the consequences of type one and type two errors whenever you're thinking about statistics, right? You're going to have to use this to decide what your type one and type two error rates should be. So, um, we may decide on an acceptable type one error rate alpha. We have our reasons for that alpha, right? We did our probability. We've decided this is an acceptable error rate for some reason um, and uh, go on with our... And uh, once we've decided on that acceptable type 1 error rate, we would probably then focus on a particular theta A. Like, for example, going back to that coin flip example, we might say, I don't actually care if I, if I decide that a coin with probably getting heads of 0.51 is fair. If that happens, it's fine. It's essentially fair. If, if the probability of getting hence is 0.51, I'm not in a casino, so I, I'm okay with that. But I would hate to say that a coin with probably getting heads is 0.6, that that's a fair coin. I would hate to say that. So I'm going to make the type 2 error rate in that scenario, I don't know, 0.05. And actually, once you do those two things, once you've said... Um, once you've said this is my type 1 error rate and I want a type 2 error rate for this effect or this difference from the null hypothesis, then you can actually figure out a sample size in many situations that will achieve those parameters. That will achieve that both uh, that type 2 error rate for the type 1 error rate you decided. Right. So, And that's a part of study planning. By the way, for what it's worth, never, ever, 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 ever Look at the type 2 error rate after you did your study. Never, ever do that. Because let's suppose that you reject the null hypothesis. Um, no, let's say that you don't reject the null hypothesis of the coin being uh, fair, but you got a sample proportion of uh, 0.51. Let's say that happened. And then you look at the type 2 error rate and decide, oh, well, if the true proportion was 0.51, uh, the odds of rejecting the test of rejecting the null hypothesis were very small. So we just didn't have a powerful enough study to uh, detect this effect. We didn't have a large enough sample size. That's, that reasoning is circular. That reasoning is completely circular because of, of course he didn't reject it in that situation. <laughs> uh, like, of course he didn't because you cannot distinguish those effects. If you wanted to distinguish that effect, you needed a larger sample size. Um, so... Uh, your study was never equipped to do that, so you can't all of a sudden say, well, actually, the true proportion is 0.51. We just didn't have the power to do it. Uh, we didn't have the power to detect it because that's essentially circular reasoning. You've said nothing. So never, ever, ever look at type 2 error rates after you uh, compete at a p-value and got your conclusions and stuff. Okay. All right. That was all like conceptual discussion and it took a really long time. And I'm, I'm actually really sorry, but I just, I can't, I can't not talk about it. I have to say something. 
So uh, let's actually do some numerical examples of um, of um, uh, of a, a hypothesis testing. So uh, here is our first example. We're going to have two, and they're both going to be really long. <laughs> so because basically what we're going to do in these examples is construct hypothesis tests. And after we go through this process of constructing a hypothesis test, after that, all I have to do is tell you how to compute test statistics and p-values. And that's it, right? So right now, I'm just trying, like the most important part of what I'm about to do is that you learn not just about these particular hypothesis tests, but how you make a hypothesis test. And what go what is the thought process behind a hypothesis test? In later sections, it'll be really quick. It's like, here's the p-value, here's the test statistic, and so on right it, you, i'm just going to tell you right away how to compute that right but here we're going to derive it okay so i claim that i am an 80 percent free throw shooter but you don't believe me you think i make less than 80 percent of free throws to settle the dispute we agreed that i will shoot 20 free throws uh, 20 free throws and you will count how many baskets i managed to make based off this you will decide whether you believe my claim you decide to use alpha equals 0.05 as your significance level because you didn't think really hard about it and you don't really care because there are no stakes. All right. <laughs> no real world stakes in that if if you think that if you call me a liar and you're wrong, you don't care. Whatever. Um, so the first thing we're going to do in this situation is uh, identify the null alternative hypothesis. So what we're talking about here is P which is the proportion of baskets that I can make. So that's what we're looking at. Under the null hypothesis, I am a, an 80% free throw shooter. So that means that P is equal to 0.8. Under the alternative hypothesis, I am a liar, but I'm a liar in a particular direction. You don't really care if I'm a 90% free throw shooter. It's almost implicit when I say that I'm an 80% free throw shooter that I'm 80% or more, right? So, like, what you want to do is embarrass me. So there's one particular direction that you care about, which is when P is less than 0.8. Okay? Because if I'm making 90% of my baskets, then you don't really care, right? So almost implicitly, the null hypothesis is that P is greater than or equal to 0.8. It's equivalent. But we never actually say that because um, we're only going to check check for eighty percent because that's kind of the hardest situation to decide between the null alternative hypothesis. If I were making ninety percent of my free throw shots, then it would be even easier to reject the to to not reject the null hypothesis. Sorry for that word salad. Um, what is the test statistic? What is its distribution under the null hypothesis? Going back to the problem, what I'm doing is I'm shooting baskets and we're counting how many baskets I made. So that means our test statistic is going to be um, X, which is the number of baskets I make. Uh, so X is going to follow a binomial distribution because I either make a basket or I don't. I'm doing this 20 times. And we are assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So if the null hypothesis is true, the probability I make a single basket is 0.8. Um, so that means that X is going to follow a binomial distribution since that's what counts um, these types of events. So N is going to be 20 and P is going to be 0.8. And this is going to be the distribution of X if the null hypothesis is true. Okay, out of 20 baskets, I managed to make 11. Compute the p-value. So, in order to do to compute the p-value, the p-value is going to be... And by the way, a lot of people like to write just p, but there's eventually going... p for the p-value, but there's going to come a point where there's going to be p's everywhere because we're going to talk about, like, uh, testing for proportion like in this situation actually there's another p up here p equals 0.8 so there's going to be like p p naught p hat and all that stuff so i conventionally write p val like so just to keep things just to uh, help keep notation straight and be clear about what we're talking about because there's p's everywhere 
Uh, like, here's another P. <laughs> All right. So, it's the probability of getting a test statistic at least as contradictory to the null hypothesis and at least in favor of the alternative as what we actually observed. So, I made 11 baskets. What would be a situation that would be even worse for the null hypothesis? Well, if I made 10 baskets, that would be even worse. If I made 9 baskets or 8 baskets or 7, that is even more contradictory to the null hypothesis than what we saw. Um, on the other hand, if I made 12 baskets, that would almost be more in favor of the null hypothesis. Or it's not against the null hypothesis if I made 12. So that means that the p-value is going to be the probability that I made a, uh, 11 baskets or fewer. So at least as contradictory to the null. Uh, contradictory to the null is, few, is not many baskets. I don't make a lot of baskets, right? So a uh, small x. Okay, now this is the CDF of a binomial random variable at 11. Um, so the parameters are 20 and 0.8, because, and it's 0.8 because the null hypothesis is assumed to be true. So this is the CDF of a binomial, and this is going to be 0 0.010. So what is the conclusion of the test? At the very beginning, we decided that alpha was 0.05. So that means the p-value is going to be 0 0.01, and this is less than 0 0.05, which was your significance level. Since the p-value is less than your significance level, you should reject the null hypothesis. And there is a consequence for this. This means something in the real world. It means that your, that your belief now about the real world is I make, uh, as in me, uh, I make less um, than 80% uh, of baskets. And by the way, this is not based off of real data. I'm pretty sure that I do not make more than 10% of my baskets. I have not played. I have not shot a basketball in years. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, this is not real world data. Uh, if I were making 55% of my free throws, as this problem suggests, then I would be pretty proud of myself. Uh, all right, fifth part. And this is where things kind of get um, interesting. Let's, excuse me. Uh, let N alpha denote the fewest number of baskets I could make while still allowing you to believe my claim when you use a significance level alpha. So that is, if x is following a binomial distribution with parameters 20 and 0.8, n alpha is the largest number such that the probability that x is less than n alpha is less than or equal to alpha. Find n of 0 0.05. So this, what this basically corresponds to is a boundary between, between accepting or rejecting the null. Okay, hold on. I just said a bad word. We never accept the null hypothesis. You never say that. Um, all right, but um, I'm trying to find a number that is on the boundary between rejecting and not rejecting the null hypothesis. So this corresponds to uh, like saying, all right, I shoot tw 20 free throws, and if I make less than uh, 15, then you're going to call me a liar. Something like that. Um so what would that number be? Well, and also I say less than or equal to alpha because um, it's probably, ideally we would say equals alpha. But because X is a discrete random variable, there's a finite number of probabilities that we could potentially have. So I can't actually, so there's a very good chance that 0.05 is not even an option for this probability. So we can't say equals alpha, so we're just gonna make it as close to alpha as we can while being less than alpha. Okay, so uh, find n of 0 0.05. So uh, let's start out by saying this, the probability that x is less than n alpha uh, is equal to the probability that x is less than or equal to n alpha minus one uh, 
And uh, so that corresponds to uh, the CDF uh, at n alpha minus 1 uh, when the parameters are 20 and 0.8. And this number needs to be... And so the CDF needs to be less than or equal to alpha, but we want to make n alpha as large as possible such that this is the case. Okay. So let's uh, let's let's go ahead and boot up R and see if we can find that alpha. I mean, I know what it is. I wrote it down, but I, I want to show you. Um, so let's do this. P binom uh zero to twenty because um the most I baskets I could make is twenty and the fewest is zero and I want all the integers in between and prob will be equal to point eight and size will be equal to twenty for twenty baskets. Uh this is unfortunate so those are hard to read. Let's round uh to let's say three digits. Okay. The, uh, and of course, none of these are actually zero. You can kind of tell from here, but they're, they're very close to zero. All right, so let's scan through this. Um, actually, let's save this in a vector. Uh, let's call it P. And then names P will be uh, zero to 20. That should make things more readable. Okay, so I could scan through this. And I want to find a number that causes this thing to... So to be so for all of these, uh, the CDF is less than 0.05. Uh, here at 12, the CDF is less than 0.05, and when we go to 13, it goes to 0.087, which is greater than 0.05. So that means that the that the input to the CDF is going to be 12. So. Um, 12 is the largest number such that the CDF is less than or equal to uh, uh, 0.05. So going back to this, we could say that uh, since uh, B12 uh, um, 20 and 0.8 is less than or equal to 0 0.05, that's going to, and it's the largest number that does that, that means that n alpha minus 1 is equal to 12, which means that uh, n alpha is equal to, or actually n alpha, that's 0 0.05, uh, 0 0.05, because we actually plugged in a number now. So that means that n alpha is going to be 13. So if I make less than 13 baskets, you will call me a liar. That's how you should interpret this number. Um, by the way, there was actually an easier way to do what I did in R, and I was aware of it. I just, I wanted to, I just wanted to show the logic of it. But we could, what we could have done instead was uh, do Q binom 0.05 prob equals 0.8 size equals 20. Oh, okay. So I guess that would have given up, given us the number directly because of however it is they're defining. Uh, the uh, of this uh, Q function, I think I've talked about this before. That uh, they have a slightly different way to think about it than I do, uh, but it's fine. So, okay, so um, right, continuing on. While alpha is equal to 0.05 is the specified type one error rate due to the discrete nature of the test statistic. It's not the actual type one error rate. What is the actual type one error rate? Uh, well, we actually did. Uh, compute that already so we're going to reject the the uh... sorry about that um, uh, we're going to uh, reject uh, the null hypothesis if we make 12 or fewer baskets so that means that the actual type 1 error rate is 0 0.032 since that's the corresponding event so uh, the or uh, did I say type 2 error? I meant type 1 error. Okay, so this will be the actual type 1 error rate. So the probability of a type 1 error uh, is going to be 0 0.032. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, seven. Suppose I were not an 80% free throw shooter uh, and instead only made 75% of my baskets. What was a type 2 error rate in this in this case? As I said before, you never actually do type 2 error analysis after you conduct a study. Uh, we're doing it. We're doing something like that here just because I want to demonstrate concepts. But you would never actually do something like this after you saw a sample. So if I were not an 80% free throw shooter and instead only made 75% of my baskets... Was a type two error rate? Seventy five percent of my baskets. That's fifteen. So, um, so uh, I want to. Com so, okay, rejecting the null hypothesis means that we have the random variable. Let's call it x prime. So, x prime in this scenario follows a binomial distribution with uh, parameters twenty and 0.75. Okay, what I want to do is compute the probability that x prime is less than the cutoff, which is uh, 13. All right, this corresponds to the event of reject the null hypothesis of, no, 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 no. Uh, x prime is greater than or equal to 13. So I'm not rejecting the null hypothesis when I should have. All right, what is this probability going to be? This is going to be 1 minus the probability that x prime is less than or equal to 12. Um, and that's going to be uh, 1 minus the CDF at uh, 12, uh, given parameters 20 and 0.75. And that is something that I uh, already computed, uh, which is 0.898. So actually, that there's a very high likelihood of making a type 2 error in this type of situation. Um, so that is something to be aware of when looking at this. I might actually be an, an, a 75% free throw shooter, uh, free throw shooter, and the probability of not detecting that is almost 90%. So that's something to consider. Uh, here's some R code that's doing similar stuff, um, and uh, uh, yeah, you can kind of guess what's going on. Uh, I'm going to be right back. I should probably uh, return that call real quick, but you probably won't notice because I'm just going to join the two videos together. So I'll see you in a second. Hey everyone. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, that was the mechanic for my car. Uh, just letting me know that my car is ready to be picked up. So it was an important phone call. Uh, anyway, uh, resuming the discussion. Uh, so that was the uh, that's the conclusion of that. We basically studied a test for Bernoulli data or success fail data, however you want to call it, two outcomes. Uh, we just studied that, um, and uh, we saw effectively how to formulate hypotheses, how to compute a p value. And one thing I really like about that example is I hope that the logic behind the p-value was intuitive. I hope it was intuitive to you, what we were doing. Um, um, so computed a p-value. Um, we, uh, uh, we uh, in addition to computing a p-value, we also did some type two error analysis uh, after the fact, which I told you not to do, but um, the, you know, ideally you would have done it before then. Uh, but uh, we t looked at it. We saw we computed a, a probability of a type two error. I hope the logic of the type two error made sense to you. It was the probability of not rejecting the null hypothesis when the actual probability that I make um, uh, when the actual probability I make a basket is 0.75. And this test is actually like the like the reasoning used there is actually a useful test. Um, a later chapter, we're going to talk about small sample uh, 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 hypothesis testing for Bernoulli data or uh, two outcome data. And I'm not even going to really mention it because it's like that was the example. So this example is, in fact, a real test. And the procedures used here are real procedures. Uh, so the next example is a test for population mean. And again, we're deriving the test. Um, 
later on, I may give you formulas for this, but the objective of this example is to show you how those formulas come about and how to be thinking about how this is working. So uh, this is again going to be a long example. It's like several parts because we're developing a test. We're developing a test and analyzing it. So uh, let mu denote the population mean. We wish to determine if the true population mean is greater than the specified value mu naught. State the null alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis says that the true mean is equal to mu naught. The alternative hypothesis is that the true mean is greater than mu naught. Uh, all right, so that's that's part one. Uh, part two, we collect a data set from the population. The mean of that data is mu and the standard deviation is sigma. And I didn't say it, but I should have. This data is IID. Uh, consider the test statistic Z, which is equal to X bar minus mu naught divided by sigma over the square root of, the, square root of N. According to the central limit theorem, which you wouldn't need if you just assumed the data was normally distributed, but I like the central limit theorem. It is my favorite theorem. People have been able to identify me because I say the like, I like the central limit theorem. So according to the central limit theorem, what is the approximate distribution of Z under the null hypothesis? Well, uh, X, so the mean of X bar uh, is going to be mu naught if the null hypothesis is true. Um, and the standard deviation of x bar is going to be sigma over screwed n, uh, over the square root of n, which doesn't really matter uh, whether the null hypothesis what what the null hypothesis is. That's always what it's going to be. So um, we are basically assuming that we know what sigma is, which is an unrealistic assumption, but whatever. Uh, so if this is the case, then we have uh, a random a sample mean minus its population mean divided by its standard error, which is the statistics standard deviation. So according to the central limit theorem, the distribution of the statistics should be the standard normal distribution asymptotically. Um, all right, so uh, that's going to matter when we're trying to compute p-values. What is the approximate distribution when, when the alternative is true? And mu is equal to mu a, which is greater than mu naught. So let's think very carefully about this one. If this is the case, then when we look at our statistic x bar minus mu naught divided by sigma over root n, we are not actually subtracting x bar. We're not actually subtracting x bar's mean from it anymore. So this is not going to follow a standard normal distribution since Basically, we have improperly normalized the sample mean if the alternative is true and this is the actual mean. So here's what we should do. We should try to figure out, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say we have x bar minus mu a uh, plus mu a minus mu naught. X bar has been improperly normalized under the uh, with this statistic, so we're going to try to get a properly normalized version of it. And then we're still dividing by sigma over the square root of n. Uh, so this can be this is going to equal after you break up that fraction, uh, x bar uh, minus mu a divided by sigma over root n plus mu a minus mu naught. Uh, divided by sigma over root n. And if the alternative hypothesis is true, then the distribution of this thing will be a normal distribution, a standard normal distribution, that is. So that means that we have a standard normally distributed random variable shifted by this amount that I have in the red box. So the distribution of the test statistic in this scenario will be a normal distribution with mean mu a minus mu naught over sigma over root n uh, and uh, standard deviation one. All right, this, this, is, this is valuable to look at. Let's think even harder about this. What this is saying is uh, we have the black distribution, which is, this, which is the standard normal curve, which is the curve that we are using to compute p-values. So it's centered around zero, and this is the distribution we think that the, that the test statistic will follow uh, 
if the null hypothesis is true. But that's not actually true. The distribution that the test statistic follows uh, under this alternative hypothesis is actually the red distribution, which is going to be uh, n of uh, mu a minus mu naught divided by sigma over root n, 1. So it is centered around the value mu a minus mu naught over sigma over root n. Okay, that's where it's centered. So that would mean that a typical value for this random variable for this for this test statistic under this alternative hypothesis is something like this. In which case, um, it looks somewhat well. Actually, let's uh, let's let's do something like this. An even more typical value would be something like this, which under the red curve looks like a typical value, but under the black curve which is what we think it comes from if the, normal, if the null hypothesis is true, this is an extreme value. Like this is highly unlikely um, if the null hypothesis were true. So we should reject the null hypothesis in that case. And, 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 it, and it, so what this is showing is that if this alternative is true, then we're probably going to reject the null hypothesis because a lot of values under this alternative are core are falling into that into that small tail region. In fact, it seems unlikely to be a typical value under the null hypothesis if the alternative is true. Um, and also it tells you, like the fact that the shift is happening at this location, that this is the center of the actual distribution of the test statistic, that tells you a few things. Um, like the distance between mu a and mu naught matters relative to the standard error. The standard error is down here. And uh, what happens as we, as, as we look at that standard error? Uh, a few things, actually. The, for starters, we can rewrite this uh, quantity as the square root of n times mu a minus mu naught over sigma. So that's one way to rewrite this which means a few things. Uh, we know that since mu a is greater than mu naught, that, the, that this quantity is actually greater than zero. So as you increase your sample size, uh, that means that this red curve is getting pushed off to infinity. So one way to improve the power of your test by looking at this formula is to increase your sample size. And that's a good thing. You should have power increasing as you increase sample size. It should be easier and easier to detect an effect for larger sample sizes, or to detect a difference, that is. And additionally, um, this we, we have a normalization by sigma, so mu a minus mu naught, the difference between those two matters relative to the standard deviation of the data. Since it matters relative to the standard deviation of the data, that means that for data with high standard deviations, like... Um, for high standard deviations, uh, you might actually have... Um, uh, like mu a and mu naught might look actually rather close to each other, um, uh, whereas uh, for small standard deviations they might look actually rather far away. So the diff the distance between mu a and mu naught matters only through the for, through the lens of the standard deviation. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, let alpha be the level of uh, level of significance of the test we will reject the null hypothesis when z is larger than some threshold value, uh, which is what makes sense, especially when you look at a picture like this. Um, for starters, if your z is large, then that means that your sample mean was large relative to your uh, mean under the null hypothesis, it, because that means that x bar is greater than mu naught and not only, not only greater than mu naught, but much larger. Okay, so it makes sense that large z should be what's contradictory to the null hypothesis since that means that you observed sample means much larger than what you thought under the null hypothesis. And since the alternative hypothesis says that the sample mean that the that the actual mean is larger than what you think, that should be evidence in favor of the alternative and against the null. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis when z is larger than some threshold value. Find this threshold value such that the type 1 error rate is alpha. Okay, well, what's that going to be? Um, 
we are looking for some quantity such that if the actual distribution is a standard normal curve, uh, the probability of being above this threshold is equal to alpha. Well, that's Z alpha. The Z alpha that I have been mentioning over and over again in previous videos. Um, uh, so that means that the probability that Z is greater than or equal to Z alpha uh, is equal to alpha. So it's going to... So as a reminder... Uh, Z alpha satisfies uh, 1 minus phi of uh, Z alpha is equal to alpha. So this, this will be satisfied. Okay? So basically, if we observe um, a, uh, a, a test statistic that exceeds this value, Z alpha, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. And the probability of making a type 1 error, which is rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true, is going to be alpha in this situation. Since if the null hypothesis is true, z is following a standard normal distribution, and the probability of being above this quantity in such a case is going to be alpha. Uh, 5. Compute beta mu a. This is the probability of not rejecting the null hypothesis when mu equals mu a. In other words, z is less than the threshold value even though mu is equal to mu a, which is greater than mu naught. So that means that the actual distribution that, that, that the test statistic is following is, um, is uh, uh, this distribution. All right? Well then, uh, so there's probably not enough room here, so everything here is going to be a part of this. Uh, beta of mu a is the probability of making a type two error when mu equals mu a. So this is the so this is the probability that you don't reject the null hypothesis when uh, mu equals mu a. All right. So that is the probability um, that. Uh, let's see. Let's actually call. Um, let's say that, uh, Z prime, uh, so we have, let, let, let's say for notational purposes, Z prime, uh, stop it. Uh, Z prime follows a normal distribution with mean mu a minus mu naught divided by sigma over root N one. This is the distribution of the test statistic under the alternative hypothesis. So this is the probability that uh no, actually, you know what? I don't I don't like that. I changed my mind. Um so we're we're asking for the probability that z is less than z alpha. Um since this corresponds to the event where we don't reject the null hypothesis. And this is equal to the probability that x bar minus mu a over sigma over root n minus, no, uh, yeah, minus mu naught minus mu a. I did a little bit of algebra. You can check that, the, that this agrees with what I wrote before. Uh, divided by sigma over root n. This all needs to be less than uh, or equal to uh, Z alpha um, hmm. yeah so Z alpha plus uh, mu naught minus mu a over uh, uh, sigma over root n Okay, and, uh, oh, oh, okay, that's, all right, let me rewrite this part. Um, I, I needed to pay a little bit more attention to my notes. Uh, so this, let's see. So this is equal to, my apologies, uh, the probability that x bar minus mu a uh, 
uh, over sigma over, over root n uh, minus mu naught uh, minus mu a over sigma over root n. Um, plus mu naught minus mu a over sigma over root n is less than or equal to z alpha uh, plus mu naught minus mu a over sigma over root n. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is equal to the probability. Eh. This is equal to the probability that uh, x bar minus mu a over sigma over root n is less than or equal to z alpha uh, plus mu naught minus mu a over sigma over root n. So notice that the part in red is following a standard normal distribution. So this is going to be the CDF of the standard normal curve at Z alpha plus uh, mu naught minus mu a uh, uh, minus, fine, ignore me. Okay, fine, ignore everything that I do. Okay, <laughs> um, stupid laggy computer. Uh, Z alpha plus mu naught minus mu a uh, over sigma over root n. And here's the thing about what we've put in here. This quantity, mu naught is less than mu a. So this quantity is less than zero. Um, that matters uh, because as we increase our sample size, we are adding a, an increasingly negative term to Z alpha, which causes the argument to the CDF to approach negative infinity. That would mean that the prob that would mean that the CDF is approaching negative infinity, so that means the CDF so the value of the CDF is approaching zero. That means that as we increase our sample size, the probability of making a type two error is going to zero. That's good. Uh, given the answers to four and five, find a sample size n such that the test with a type one error rate alpha has will have a type two error rate beta when mu equals mu a. So we're going to say that beta, uh, I want black, that beta is equal to uh, phi of uh, z alpha uh, minus mu a minus mu naught divided by sigma over root n. Okay. This whole term is equal to uh, negative z beta. Since this is going to be the uh, quantile, uh, since, since this is the corresponding quantile. All right, so therefore we get to say uh, that negative z beta uh, is equal to z alpha uh, minus mu a minus mu naught over sigma over root n, which means that. Uh, uh, z alpha plus z beta uh, is equal to um, negative mu a minus mu naught um, over sigma times the square root of n. And you do even more algebra, and what we're trying to do is solve for n. So in the end, n is going to be uh, sigma times z alpha plus z beta over mu a minus mu naught. And this whole thing is squared. And we're also going to round up because it's a sample size. So that was after you solve for n. I'm willing to bet that someone out there did not fully understand what I just did here. What I said is that there are two quantities that satisfy uh, this relation. One is that, uh, so if beta is equal to phi at that input value, 
then there are two quantities that satisfy this. The input value and also negative z beta. So therefore, those two things must be equal. Um, and then once we set up that, e that equality, we're then able to solve the equation for n, which is what we want, since this is, an, this is essentially a sample size planning formula. As I mentioned before, we're often in a situation where we're going to do type 2 error analysis, decide on a desired type 2 error rate um, for our study. And um, we decide on a type 2 error rate. We... Um, um, we decide for a desired effect size. The effect size is mu a minus mu naught. So we want to have the type 2 error rate beta when mu equals mu a. So then we find a sample size that will achieve that um, via those uh, equations. All right, so next part. We've actually done all of the theoretical analysis of the test. We have a formula for type 2 errors, we have a formula for sample size planning, and so on. So we actually start to get to, get to plug in numbers. Suppose we are investigating whether men's average height is 5.9 feet, and under the alternative hypothesis, men are taller than 5.9 feet. Phrase the null alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis says the mean height for men is equal to 5.9 feet. The alternative says that the mean is greater than 5.9 feet. All right, so that's part seven. Uh, part eight, letter significance level B alpha equals 0 0.1. The standard deviation of height is known to be 0 0.5. Suppose the true mean height for men is six feet. What then will be the type two error rate when n equals 100? Uh, repeat for a potential mean height of 6.5 feet. So if this is the case where our significance level is 0.1, then Z alpha, which is Z 0.1, will be 1.28 approximately. So we want to figure out the type two error rate when the true mean height of men is six uh, feet. So this corresponds to mu a. Well, that's going to be, uh, according to the formula that we obtained above, phi of 1.28 um, minus uh, 6.59 over no six minus five point nine my apologies i don't know why i wrote that uh six minus five point nine uh divided by the standard deviation sigma which is 0 0.5 divided by the square root of 100 and that is going to be uh approximately after you plug uh figure out all those numbers negative 0 0.72 uh, and this is going to equal uh, 0.2358. So that means that the probability of making a type 2 error when men's feet is actually six, men's height is actually six feet high, is about 24%, which is okay. That's fine. Um, well, whether it's fine or not depends on what you want. Okay, let's repeat this for uh, for 6.5. So beta at 6.5. This number should this uh, the probability of a type two error rate in this situation should be even smaller, since um, uh, since uh, well basically this is a larger mean height, so this is going to be phi at one point two eight minus uh, six point five minus five point nine over zero point five divided by the square root of a hundred. Uh, I actually don't have this written down in my notes, so I'm going to very quickly compute this. Uh, let's see. We have uh, 1.28 minus uh, 6.5 minus 5.9 uh, divided by uh, 0 0.5. 5 divided by the square root of 100. So that's negative 10.72. So this is going to be the CDF of the standard normal curve at negative 
seven two, and that's approximately zero. I don't need to look that up. That's a very small number. That's st that's ten standard deviations away from the mean of zero. That's that's going to be infinitesimally small. So, uh, yeah. So next up, uh, find the sample size such that for a test with an alpha of 0 0.1, it would have a type two error rate of beta equals 0 0.1 when the true average height is six feet. So um, in this case, Z beta, oops, uh, Z beta is equal to Z alpha, which is Z 0 0.1, which is equal to 1.28. All right then. Uh, so, according to the sample size planning formula that we came up with, uh, the sample size that we need is going to be 0 0.5, that's the standard deviation, times 1.28, that's Z alpha, plus 1.28, that's Z beta. Uh, all of this divided by uh, 6 minus 5.9, and then we square this. And this is going to be... Um, 164.4 rounded up, which is 165. So in other words, if you want to be able to detect um, a, a true mean height of six feet um, in this, in this uh, context, we actually need 165 observations rather than 100 if we want our type two error rate to be 0.1. So maybe actually go ahead, take this formula, go back to the original, um, uh, to, to this uh, formulation right here, but replace replace uh, 100 with 165, and what you'll find is that your type 2 error rate is actually very close to 0.1. That might be a good exercise for you to do. All right, all of that was sample size stuff, and then in the end, we have an actual uh, we have an actual study. So we actually perform the study after we've done all of our sample size planning business. So, um, a sample mean height of 5.97 is observed, and the sample size is the one found in part 9 above. So we decided that that was the effect that we wanted to detect. Compute the p-value. So the sample mean is 5.97 feet. So our test statistic is going to be 5.97 minus 5.9 divided by uh, 0 0.5 divided by the square root of 165. Uh, so this is going to equal 1.80 approximately. So then the p-value is going to be the probability that a standard normal random variable is greater than 1.80, the number that we actually observed. This is going to be 1 minus phi at 1.80, which is equal to 0 0.0359. Based off this data was the conclusion of the test. Since the p-value is uh, equal to 0 0.0359, uh, which is less than 0 0.1, which is our significance al level alpha, that means that we should reject the null hypothesis and conclude that men are taller than 5.9 feet. All right, so that's it. Here's actually some uh, R code that's doing very similar work. Um, you can read, it, read through it if you want, but it's essentially using R as a calculator. So uh, at this point, I'm going to conclude the lecture because it's uh, taken quite a bit of time and this is probably a little exhausting. So good news though, is that we've done a lot of the hard work because at this point, I can just tell you formulas and not ask you to derive them anymore. All right? I can just tell you, uh, this, is, you know, this is the formula for the p-value, this is the formula for finding sample sizes, this is the formula for type 2 errors, and, and so on and so forth. So we have, in this section, studied the null hypothesis testing framework. We studied that in great detail, and now we get to do null hypothesis testing. All right, uh, I look forward to seeing you in the other videos. I guess I won't see you, but it's something that people say. So I'll see you then.